Okay, Doug, I tried that. Don't, we're not going to record. Yeah. Uh. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the NSTA Web Seminars, where you can find live interactive learning at your desktop. My name is Carolyn Moore, and I will be moderating today's program. Today's seminar is titled The Science of Modern Agriculture, the Evolution of Crop Ro Protection, a Historical Perspective. Our presenters are Valerie Bays, Cole Wagner, Michael Crawford, Liza Helcom, and Doug Sammons. And now I'm going to turn our microphone over to our first presenter. Val, go ahead. Hello, all. Thank you so much for um, spending your time with us this evening. Um, this is the third part of the five-part series where we, be, we will be talking about the science of modern agriculture. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, in this particular segment, we're going to be talking all about crop protection. But if you wanted to check out the, the previous two webinars that we did, the first one was about plant breeding and GMOs, and the second one was about insects. Um, which leads us to, after this presentation, in January, we're going to be talking about engineering in agriculture and data science. Um, and then February, we're going to leave it open based on the feedback that you all give us on some topics you'd like us to cover as it relates to the science of modern agriculture. And then in March, that brings us to the National Conference. Monsanto will be at the National Conference. We'll have a booth and a couple of breakout sessions. So if you plan on being there, we'd love for you to stop by and say hello. Um, Carolyn, if you could do the poll. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, for those of you who are not sure where the polling button is, it's right underneath your name. It's the fourth icon over, and it has a green check mark right now. So go ahead and uh, use the green check mark if, yes, you're coming to the national conference, and a red X if you're unable to attend. We'll give everybody just a couple of seconds to do that. Remember, if you're on a mobile device, it's right underneath the main screen. All right, I'm going to go ahead and lock that now and publish the results. All right, great. Well, for those 11 of you who will be at the – oh, sorry, I have that back, uh, backwards. For the three of you who will be at the National Conference, be sure to stop by. We'll have some resources for you. So when I think about the sophistication of modern agriculture, I see very clearly how it aligns to the next generation science standards. But I would love for you all to use the tools in the sidebar to kind of show us where you think some of this alignment is. Thank you, Valerie. So uh, the toolbox has been made available to you. It's that long, skinny rectangle. Please go down to the very bottom and choose the common symbols from the bottom tab and uh, begin to place your symbol on the chart. Looks like they're finding it. Valerie, we'll give them a few seconds to uh, fill it in. Great. Thank you for participating. I think that all of the panelists this evening would absolutely agree with where these check marks are popping up. Whether in climate, human sustainability, natural selection and evolution, chemical reactions, yes, there are lots of opportunities in the science curriculum to infuse some of these concepts um, as it relates to the science of agriculture. Okay, so for this evening, we have an action-packed agenda. We're going to open up with introductions. I'll take you through some helpful teacher resources. Then we'll get into the heart of the presentation by starting off with the history of agriculture and some of the efficiencies that have developed through uh, leveraging technology, uh, the safety of crop protection and how that's uh, evaluated, um, new crop protection and how that discovery phase works, and then into um, resistance. 
and then we'll open it up for Q and A. I should note that after each presentation, um, we will take two questions. Okay, so just a quick highlight: there's a new documentary called Food Evolution. Food Evolution was um, funded and curated by the Institute of Food Technologists. Um, this is streaming on Hulu and available on YouTube as well. From my understanding, USFRA, which stands for the United States Farmers and Ranchers Alliance, uh, will be working to um, create some curriculum that goes along with this new documentary. I personally really got a lot of value out of this new documentary because I think it takes a really pragmatic view and evidence-based view on all the different um, production methods. And since we have so much to cover this evening, I'm not going to go through each and every one of these resources, but I highly recommend going back um, once the program is over and uh, Googling some of these things. We've got um, some suggestions for a really great podcast, so on your ride to work, you can just pop that on and when you get to your destination, you kind of feel good about learning something. Um, teacher professional development resources uh, and some other uh, resources to check out there. And one resource I want to highlight in particular is a collaboration that we have with Agriculture in the Classroom. Um, we are receiving quite a few requests from students, um, even as young as seventh grade, who are asking for access to transgenic seeds and conventional seeds so that they could do experiments for their science fair project or just for the classroom. Um, so we developed a partnership with Ag in the Class to make those available. Um, if you follow the kit link there, uh, you can go to the uh, the portal where you can order the Roundup Ready soybeans and conventional soybeans. And the second link will take you to the open source lesson plan um, with all the different activities that go along with the seed. OK, so now for introduction. My name is Valerie Bays. My background is in biological science. I went to the University of Missouri-Columbia. Um, I majored in biology because I thought that I wanted to go to dental school. It really wasn't until my last semester uh, of undergrad that I realized I was not as passionate about oral health, so what would I be doing with this biology degree? Um, I started working for a data science company, um, kind of felt like a glorified proofreader and the work wasn't satisfying to me, so anytime I interact with students I always say knowing what you don't want to do is just as important as knowing what you do want to, um, which led me to then kind of kicking around some time and substitute teaching at a local school district and I loved it. So I went back to school, I got my master's in education and certification in secondary biology. And around that time, Monsanto was looking to ramp up their education outreach efforts. Um, Monsanto, we're an agriculture company that develops solutions and sells products to farmers. Um, for a long time, we didn't do the best job of speaking to consumers. Um, consumers were curious about where their food comes from and how it's grown, and we really didn't have a, a a particular effort to help them understand the, the questions, the answers to their questions. And so a part of my job is helping teachers in particular uh, to, to, to gain access to our researchers or our subject matter experts um, and to work and make these tangible lesson plans that help to bring the science of agriculture to life in the classroom. Um, I'll pass it over to Cole. Cole's going to be helping to facilitate our um, window chat. And answering your question. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Cole Wagner, and I am a communication guy. So uh, the, the rest of the, the crew here, these, these are scientists, and uh, I, I do communications. So my focus is on is on crop protection. So uh, a lot of what I do is is working with with uh, scientists like these and uh, like Val and the rest, and um, kind of t telling our story to media on social media and uh, elsewhere. So. Uh, happy to be a part of this program, and I will be participating in the, the chat room on the bottom left corner of your screen. So feel free to uh, send any questions, and I'll try to answer them to the best of my abilities. Thank you. Doug? Good evening, everyone. My name is Doug Sammons, and I've been with Monsanto about 33 years. I got my uh, BS degree in biochemistry and my PhD in chemistry and the study of the uh, mechanisms of enzymes from Ohio State University. 
before I went to uh, Penn State University and State College to study the design of drugs for cancer therapy. About that time, I had two job offers. I could have gone to Abbott to design cardiovascular drugs, uh, but there were a bunch of guys doing that, and so there was nobody designing herbicides in Monsanto when I came there in 1984. And so I started there in the herbicide department, designing specific herbicides. Later, I moved on to the study of insect physiology, and then herbicide physiology, and seed vigor and physiology. And then I helped make uh, some of the new versions of Roundup Ready that people are using today. Uh, and these days, I've been studying glyphosate-resistant weeds and the mechanisms of action at the molecular level. Um, I live in the St. Louis area, my wife, and we raised seven kids and uh, did all the stuff for the high school marching band and 4-H, and today we uh, have some chickens and some angora bunnies and some honeybees. We have uh, about 30 hives in our apiary. Thank you. Elijah. Hi there, my name is Elijah Brown. I'm uh, an emergency medicine physician with a special interest in global health and I'm also a medical toxicologist. I am on, currently on the faculty at Washington University in St. Louis and I'm also... Uh, I Hold on, Eliza? Yep. Eliza, excuse me, this is Don Boonstra. We're yep. having a lot of trouble hearing you now even though we've done successful mic checks. Your voice okay. isn't coming through very clearly and we've got a lot of sort of background hum. Hmm. Okay, let me just see if that helps. Is that better? That is better. Okay. All right. So, uh, my name is Eliza Dunn. Uh, I'm a medical toxicologist and an emergency medicine physician with a special interest in global health. I'm on the faculty at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, okay, well Eliza. Sorry, I'm going to bounce in again because the quality is just really not there and it's going to be frustrating. In that okay. moderators tab, if you remember, I gave that phone number. Okay. If you can call in on a cell phone on that phone number and the pin is in there, um, okay. we'll just do it that way. I think that'll be a lot easier. You can still advance the slides and everything. Okay, sounds good. Right. You want to have that? Mike, talk while I'm doing it. Yeah, while you're doing that, we'll uh, go on to Mike. Michael? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Michael Crawford. Um, I've been at Monsanto for the past six years. Um, I grew up in an Air Force family, so uh, I've lived in 13 cities, but uh, I graduated from high school and uh, from and college from, uh, from Georgia, I went to University of Georgia, so I call that home. Uh, then got my graduate degree from Washington University in St. Louis and uh, moved on to University of Pennsylvania for some, uh, some postgraduate work. Um, my lifelong passion and interest really has been in control of infectious disease, and that includes uh, medical and veterinary uses as well as for agricultural uses. Just some of the clever ways that these bugs uh, can get around either natural or artificial methods of, of trying to control them is, is quite fascinating, um, and I've continued the, uh, that journey here at Monsanto. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, for time's sake, Don, do you think it would make sense for Liza to just introduce herself once we get to her slides? I think that's probably a good idea. Okay, great. Well, we'll move forward then. Okay, so when a farmer or an agronomist looks out at their field, they can clearly see challenges here. In the one corner, we have erosion. We have to think about our soil health. Then we have to think about those hungry insects that want to eat our plants. We have to worry about things like disease and fungal pressure. And lastly, you have to consider the competition of weeds, the weeds that are taking the resources from your desired crops. We will need to grow as much food in the next 50 years as in the past 10,000 years combined. And compared to 1960, one farmer fed up to 25 people, and today one farmer feeds roughly 155 people. So we've made some improvements, but we still have challenges. The population is rising from about 7 billion to 9 billion. The climate is changing, so maybe pests that used to be killed off during a winter freeze um, are no longer being killed off, and that's increasing the pressure in the springtime. Arable land is declining. 
and there's a change in economics and diet. More people have a desire to eat meat, and those animals will need to be fed. But all is not lost by leveraging technology. So it is so important, the role that you all play as science teachers, to help students make observations around the, about the world around them and create solutions to some of these problems by using science, technology, engineering, and math. So up in that corner there, you can see um, a transgenic plant that looks very healthy, and we have those dead weeds kind of hanging off the tray. We have a picture of an iPad where a farmer can make better decisions on their farm by using things like data science, and they can better understand when to apply things like nitrogen and where and how much. Um, we have things like drone technology, where you have this really cool device that can go out and do scouting of your crops and check on your plant health. And then it will also take just good agronomic practices like cover crops there in the corner. But none of these solutions are a silver bullet. Agriculture is kind of unique in that it always takes a systems approach. So we're going to need to figure out the best solutions and use them in tandem. And particularly for this webinar, we're going to be focusing on the crop protection solutions. So Doug's going to tell us a little bit about the history of agriculture and the efficiency. Doug, go ahead. Sure. I'd be happy to. So um, tonight, uh, just to set the stage for how far farmers deal with pests, I think it's important to look at, um, you know, way people have looked at pests since we began doing uh, agriculture. And here I have a few clips uh, taken from some Chinese museum uh, work uh, demonstrating that people were um, inventing and solving problems with agriculture even in the 4th century and 6th century BC. Uh, and the Chinese, of course, being very meticulous, also kept uh, manuscripts. And so here you can see um, some examples of manuscripts that are as old as 1600 years, uh, 1600 BC in the 16th century um, for them to be uh, documenting methods to control pests. And so here they have a, a, a cedar. Uh, to drop seed in rows, and here they're using an oxen to pull uh, a plow. So civilization has been worried about um, making productive agriculture for a long, long time. And this graph made by the USDA Economic Research Service starting about 1850, for about 100 years here, there's not much change except as the population increased, the number of farms increased. And the, and the reason for this was around 1800, a little bit earlier, one, one person, one farmer was feeding five people, basically his family. And so as the number of, of the families increased, the population increased, there had to be more farms. This is how people fed themselves. And so at the beginning of the last century, um, things started to change about the time World War II kicked in. And two major events happened that marked the beginning of modern agriculture. In particular, for farming, there was an exchange of labor for mechanization, pesticides, and fertilizer. And of course, new seed genetics started to become popular. And so at that point, you start to see that as people moved off the farm, the farms got bigger, and the average farm size has been stable since about 1975 or so. Although these days, they tend to get a little bit bigger even. So um, this time period, or this uh, period of time where basically the mechanism, uh, mechanization has continued to increase, allowing farmers to do more and more acres. But that's enabled basically because of the use of pesticides. And, uh, and this pesticide use um, uh, takes the place of a lot of labor. And I wanted to point out here about 1995, there was really another major change, and that's the introduction of genetically modified crops. And uh, the first version was Roundup Ready technology. Now, so the question then is, what is a pesticide? And it's really, these are chemistries that are designed to control all the pests. So insects, weeds, diseases, even animals, uh, in the case of storage crops. Um, and, and then plant growth regulators, which are 
usually sort of related to herbicides. And, and about on that timeline that we had there, uh, about 65 to 1970, the Environmental Protection Agency was uh, started. And they had a definition, and it's any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating a pest. And, and that's a pretty broad definition, and it's the one we use today for registering our chemistry. Pesticides are used in conventional chemistry, of course, uh, but they're also used in organic agriculture. There's a shorter list of compounds that are used there that meet their requirements. Um, and so insect-protected genetically modified crops were also covered by pesticide regulations as plant-incorporated protectants. So the uh, incorporation of those controlling agents also became a regulated item. But I want to make it clear to everyone that when you look out the window and you see plants everywhere, what you don't see are just stems of plants. That's because plants all have their own natural defense mechanism. And these natural defense things are, all, are called allelochemicals. And there are some really specific examples that people forget about. Things like nicotine is an insecticide. Caffeine is a, thought to be a plant defense um, compound. Uh, we eat broccoli and cabbages. They use that phytoglycosides. These are insecticidal. And you, and you smell them. You know, so you know they're there in high concentrations. Cassava, and I mean hundreds of millions of people eat cassava, but they have to get the cyanide out of it before they can actually eat it. Same way with almonds, raw almonds have cyanide in them. So, so pesticides are in the norm. They're not the unusual part, right? And plants are using them, have been using them all along. And so what we've done for modern agriculture is take advantage of that strategy and use it uh, to be more efficient. And so what does that efficiency uh, look like? Um, in this uh, graphic, it's showing the amount of corn that would have, you know, in the United States from, um, what, 1866, it says, to 1920. Not a lot of improvement. Uh, the amount of corn that farmers were growing, and then how the efficiency of production improved uh, from up to 1970, 1997, about the year 2000 and 2009, how much less area was required to produce the same amount of corn. And right now, in this diagram, we're projecting that even will even be more efficient in the years to come. So this is a pretty dramatic example of how the efficiency of agriculture, especially in the modern ag era, has changed things up. Now, another way to look at this is the efficiency of um, highly mechanized agriculture in the United States, Argentina, uh, and Brazil. This moved a little bit, sorry. Uh, and, there are, and there are overall average bushel yields. So you see the United States average is about 160 bushels, uh, whereas sub-Saharan Africa is less than 20 bushels. And that's because the folks trying to grow corn in sub-Saharan Africa are doing it by hand. Basically, this represents pre- uh, 1900 agriculture, and uh, everything is done by hand, except in South Africa uh, and some areas there. And so this makes a pretty dramatic difference between the modern agricultural methods and the and the old methods. Now, there are, what are the factors affecting yield? Um, of course, Val already mentioned there are diseases, there are pests, there are weeds. Uh, and nutrient availability, and of course the weather is the big player. And so all of these things are on the farmer's mind when he makes plans, but of course each farm is different. So each farmer has a different soil. Um, they have uh, different growing seasons in different parts of the country. Uh, the kinds of agriculture they can do, whether they're rural or next to a city, uh, changes things. Uh, the total size of the farm, whether it's very large or not, depends on the mechanization they have available to them. And that, of course, is tied into the labor. And so all of these factors are important uh, in determining crop yields. So here is an example of um, uh, pretty dramatic. At the beginning of the modern ag period, everybody was doing conventional tillage. This picture was taken by Randy McElroy in central Illinois and shows the erosion caused by conventional tillage 
in the spring of 2017. In contrast, Randy took a picture here where a field is in no-till, where a farmer um, basically grows a cover crop, and then using Roundup herbicide is able to kill the cover crop and then in a, what we call a burn down, and then is able to go ahead and plant. And so there's a significant amount of soil conservation going on here and building up the, the tilt of the soil. So there's a clear association between sustainable tillage methods and the use of herbicide tolerant crops. Basically, this became the standard practice since about 1995. And so here's another example of a herbicide tolerant corn. Here uh, in the Philippines, uh, using a Ronda Pretty corn, you see uh, this gentleman, a small farmer, has got a backpack sprayer and he's spraying the weeds uh, to, control, uh, to control them with Roundup by hand. And then his, his uh, neighbors are growing the same corn without the Ronda Pretty gene. And here, of course, you see they're having to hoe. This is worth about 50 man days in the growing season. So there, and there's a huge difference here between being able to hoe and being able to just to spray to kill all of the weeds. So if you do some math, and you could, there's some math exercises here, you can do one gallon of Roundup will kills all the weeds on three acres. And if you're driving a tractor at 12 miles an hour with a, a sprayer that covers an 80-foot width spray, then you can cover uh, that amount of space in about 90 seconds. Okay, so it takes a lot of people with hose to cover that in terms of efficiency. Um, in this case, a corn shucker at a corn competi shucking competition uh, can pick about 4,500 pounds of ear corn in a day, whereas a combine, a modern combine, can, can um, picked about 200,000 pounds of shelled corn in an hour. So there's a huge difference in efficiency here. Now, all of this productivity comes can be measured in a couple different ways. One is the increase in yields uh, in our primary crops, uh, the economic gain to the farmers because of the increase and in increase in efficiency uh, during that production. But everyone else also gets a significant reduction in overall pesticide use by using herbicide tolerant crops. And because the farmers aren't out there putting on extra pesticide and extra weed control measures, there's a lot of CO2 emissions, equivalent to almost 9 million cars off the road, even in 2010. So this has improved since then. So that huge improvements in efficiency. So how much of the food dollar does the American farmer get? Well, the Agricultural Food Service here, the USDA, says about 8.6 cents. So, you know, when we talk about increased profits for farmers, we think about, you know, a lot of money. It sounds like a lot of money. But the fact is the system is huge. And um, the farmers are really getting the smallest portion of it. And the, the food production uh, system that we have today uh, has a lot of people involved, and it increases the cost quite a bit. So what's the driving force, then, is for people using conventional or modern agriculture to go to organic. And the reason for that is that most Americans, it says about half the Americans today, are actively trying to include organic. Um, and it's available in most of our grocery stores. And, of course, organic foods cost up to twice as much. And so the farmer's margin for selling organic is a little bit better. And so those who can are really interested in seeing if they can do this. The limitation is the synthetic pesticide. And so in order to do that, that there are some very careful practices that have to go on in order to match the volume production, which is very difficult. Here I'm showing a picture of strawberries. But of course, strawberries are picked by hand, whether it's organic or conventional. And this just reminds us that not everything we want, you know, can be done, can be mechanized, and that this is a, really involves a lot of hand labor. So I think I'm getting to the end. Here's a comparison of a conventional production and organic production in three categories. We're talking about uh, pesticides and chemical pesticides are evaluated for the EPA by acute toxicity and chronic toxicity. So 
the ability to form cancer and other long-term things, whereas biological uh, pesticides for the organic market really just look at acute toxicity. And these are generally synthetic or natural or synthesis of naturally occurring pesticides. And then these are primarily natural, but some of these are pretty rare, and they have to be made synthetically. So they're not all just isolated from nature. Um, and so the, they both have residue limitations required by the EPA. Another big difference is in fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers from the um, manufacture of petroleum produces a lot of ammonia, and fertilizers and organic are generally manure and compost. But the other minerals are the same, and they're made synthetically, actually. So genetic modifications for new seeds are done basically the same in both ways, except in conventional these days, we include our genetically modified uh, crops uh, in our list. Okay, so that's it, and I can uh, take any questions. Thank you so much, Doug. If you have uh, questions, please feel free to type them in the chat at this time. And we're just going to give you a few seconds to think about what uh, all these things that Doug has mentioned, and then we'll come back on and uh, check out the questions. Okay. While we're, well. while we're, let's just give them a few more seconds, Doug. And I do have one question I would like to ask uh, about the uh, pesticides. You know, you had mentioned earlier that there are a lot of things that uh, plants uh, naturally do to keep pests away from them. What specific things are they doing that we as scientists have picked up on and uh, have tried to mimic in the uh, laboratory? Well, I, actually, that's a major area of research, both for the pharmaceutical industry and herbal medicine is very common to people. But most of those active ingredients, you know, have different biological activities all the way from antibiotics to inhibiting other plants. And so some new classes of herbicides have been discovered by looking at uh, plants that um, exude defensive compounds to sort of claim their space. A famous one is the walnut tree um, secretes a compound called juggalone um, that won't allow other plants to grow uh, in the where the root zone is for the walnut tree. Um, the bottle brush has a compound that developed into a herbicide. And so, yes, people do study natural products to get ideas about what are the best methods that evolution has picked out uh, to control pests and to protect that particular plant. Thank you so much. This is just such an interesting thing to me. Uh, we do have one question from Brittany. Uh, she asks, in relation to insects, how often are biological methods used to control insects? Well, in, in conventional agriculture, they're not used very often. And part of the reason for that is because they're not very effective. Um, the thing about biological mechanisms is evolution sort of requires survivors. and so most biological control mechanisms are not 100%. Uh, they're more in the 80, 85% when they work well. And so that makes it difficult for organic farmers to get a, a blemish-free crop. Uh, but it's really unacceptable for a conventional crop on large acres to have lose 15, 20% of your um, pet to pests. Uh, and it can be a lot larger. So the problem with biological control mechanisms, uh, today they're used in some organic agricultures, um, and they are biologically produced, and um, they, they can work, but they're real sensitive to the weather uh, and to the particular species, and they are very often not absolute, so they're not 100% acute, and, um, and so there's still losses suffered when, when they're used. Thank you so much, Doug. I think uh, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. And I know that Cole and Doug will be uh, monitoring the chat window as we continue with our presentation. And now I'd like to turn the microphone over to Liza Dunn. Helcom. Liza? Hello, can everybody Hello, hear, can me now? hear me now? 
Why is it can you turn off your speaker on your computer? Liza, are you still on the phone? Hello? Liza, if you could just speak uh, loudly there, and we can hear you. Liza, we can hear you. Just talk loudly there. We're, we're hearing thumps and bumps. Sorry, everybody, this little technical problem here. Liza, go ahead and talk. Hey, Don, uh, you can move on to, to my section if you'd like, um, and I'll try to get a hold of Eliza and have her come to my office. Go ahead. Go ahead. I've got her on the phone now, I think. Thank you, everyone, for your patience while we get our technical difficulties figured out here. Michael, we could forward the slides to you if you would like to get started and come back to Liza. Uh, it's your choice. Yeah, that's fine with me. Um, yeah, why don't we go ahead and do that? I'll try to have uh, Liza come down uh, to where I'm at. She's working on dialing back in. Perhaps we'll give her just a minute then, and I know that Co mentioned that he would uh, be happy to make a few comments about safety and regulations, and I think that would be real appropriate right now, Cole, so please go ahead. Okay, can you, okay, can you hear me now? Oh, there she is. Okay, we've got How's Liza. That? How's that? All right, sorry All about right, that. All right, sorry about that. Okay, my okay, name, my is, name Liza is Liza Dunn. I'm an emergency, I'm an emergency medicine, medicine, medicine physician and a medical toxicologist. toxicologist. So, Liza, we've back got feedback here. here. We've got feedback here. If you can turn off your uh, speaker on your computer, I think that's the problem. Speaker on, speaker on my computer. I don't that's think I have the speaker on my computer. Let me just check. How's that? How's that? Is that better? Is that better? Yes, no. Can yes, no. Me? Can you hear me? Um, talk a little bit more, Liza. Okay. Okay. My name is Liza Halcom. I'm, I'm a medical toxicologist and emergency, emergency medicine physician. physician. No, we're we're getting feedback, Liza. We're hearing you twice. You hear me twice. Uh, uh, why don't I do this? People... <coughs> why don't I go? Why don't I go to Mike Crawford's computer, computer and, try, and to go from try to go from there? Okay. Do you want Cole to fill in for you for a few moments? Yeah, that would be yeah, great. Yeah, that would be great. I'll hang up and call I'll back. Up and call back. Hey, everybody. This is Cole here. Don, can you hear me all right? You're great. Thanks, Cole. Great. Hey, everybody. So Liza is a medical toxicologist, so she is truly an expert on this topic. 
Um, I, again, I'm a, I'm a communication guy, but this is one of the topics that we do talk to consumers about pretty regularly um, on social media, you know, in the media or just in conversation. So um, a couple of the points that we typically make when we're talking about crop protection or pesticides and safety is, you know, first and foremost, it's really important to understand that there are rigorous, comprehensive processes in place from uh, here in the U.S., uh, that's the EPA's job to regulate the safety of pesticides. And then, and, uh, you know, there are uh, agencies like the EPA in other countries. So um, in Europe, there's the European Food Safety Authority. Um, so when it comes to assessing pesticides, um, before companies can even make these products available, um, they undergo comprehensive evaluation. So in the U.S., the EPA requires all pesticides undergo about 100 safety studies. So those studies cover, um, as Doug was mentioning earlier, they cover the acute stuff. They cover um, chronic uh, things as well. Uh, they look at human health, uh, environmental impacts. So they take a really comprehensive look to make sure that, um, you know, before a company is going to go ahead and sell this product to farmers or, cons or, or others, that these, these products can be used safely. And then after the EPA and other regulators approve these products, uh, they continually assess the safety of these products. And that, that's one thing that I've learned at having conversations with people that a lot of people just don't know. So, you know, uh, glyphosate, for example, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, was approved about 40 years ago. Um, it has been uh, continually reviewed over those four decades and is actually currently under uh, registration review right now with the EPA. So, um, you know, not only is there a, a very comprehensive uh, evaluation before they're ever approved, um, but the, it, it's continual. And the idea there is that uh, regulators are, are they're, they're assessing the latest science and, um, you know, they're taking, they're taking all the knowledge that's available into consideration before, uh, or else they're not going to keep, they're not going to allow a product to stay on the market. So, you know, Cole, as consumers Elijah are selling, is ready. Okay. So I'll leave it at that. Cool. And, uh, sure. Thank you. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. Great. Okay. All right. My name is Liza Dunn. I'm an emergency medicine physician and a medical toxicologist with an interest in global health. I started working at Monsanto about a year ago, and I remain on the faculty at Washington University here in St. Louis. Um, I joined Monsanto because uh, I'm very interested in uh, global nutrition and uh, uh, the way modern ag can impact uh, salmon. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is um, safety regulations, uh, safety and regulations around pesticides just in general. We're going to use glyphosate really as our, as, our, uh, as our example. But what I want to do is I want to start out with a kind of question. So if you had a patient that was a 25-year-old pregnant female, and she was taking something, she was ingesting something that was a known neurotoxin, that was also known to alter the gut microbiome, kills it dead, and is associated with severe allergy. When we think about this, would you consider banning the substance? Because this is the, this is the kind of approach that people use when they're getting very concerned about um, chemicals just in general. Now, many people would say yes, because they're very concerned about this kind of thing. Now, how would you feel, however, if I said that this substance turns out to be penicillin and this lady had a life-threatening infection um, that was also uh, putting her uh, baby at risk? So really, the way we need to think about penicillin is that it's very, very beneficial and it actually can cause these problems in the big picture of things, but we need to start readjusting our thinking about chemicals in general. Penicillin, as you all know, revolutionized the treatment of infectious disease. Since 1900, the average lifespan of U.S. citizens has lengthened by greater than 30 years. And this is largely due to public health gains. And the big components of the public health gains that we've had over the years are control of infectious diseases, food security, and vaccinations. All of these have really contributed. Now, so when you're approaching this kind of uh, uh, 
idea, what you want to do is you want to sort of think of the difference between hazard versus risk. On the surface, they seem like they should be the same thing, but they actually are different. Hazard is that penicillin can cause seizures. It's extraordinarily rare. Most people don't have any kind of issue with it. You can maybe get it in super high doses or if you put it directly on the brain. Um, the risk, on the other hand, is that the likelihood of the, that penicillin will cause seizures. So it's very, very low risk that it will cause seizures. And uh, the benefits of having an antibiotic like uh, penicillin far outweigh any tiny risk that it may cause a seizure. So when we get to um, when we get to exposures to pesticides, people get very concerned about pesticides. You tend to think of them as chemicals. They don't want them in their bodies. They're, they get very worried uh, with the whole notion of pesticides. Well, it turns out, um, just like Doug was saying, is that when people consume plants, they are also eating the natural pesticides produced by those plants. Turns out that 99% of pesticides consumed are chemicals that are produced by plants to defend themselves. These include lectins and tannins and cyanogens, which, even, which, which actually get metabolized as cyanide. So when the plants are stressed or damaged uh, because of insect pressure or, or direct uh, damage, they greatly increase their natural pesticide level. And this study by Ames, that's an old study, I think, though, is very um, instructive. By 1990, only 52 of these naturally occurring pesticides had been tested. So there's not a lot sort of evaluated about these. In 1990, they found that 27 of these pesticides were actually carcinogens. These are naturally occurring in the plants. And they're commonly found at thousands of times higher than synthetic pesticides. Americans eat a gram and a half of these natural pesticides every day, which is up to 10,000 times higher than any synthetic pesticide residue that might be uh, on uh, your food products. And even further, vegans are likely eat to eat more. So there's much consideration about synthetic or pesticide residues on food. Now, there doesn't need to be because residues are very closely monitored by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency. The EPA sets limits on applied pesticides that are left on food, and these limits are called tolerances. And those are just the traces of what can be left there, okay? 99% of sampled products have residues way below the EPA tolerance. Residues that at or slightly above the tolerances do not approach an allowable daily intake. All right? So there's a big confusion about what the allowable daily intake is and the allowable pesticide residues on food, which are the tolerances. And the next couple of slides, we're going to try to discuss this a little bit more uh, carefully. So ADI, the allowable daily intake, the amount that you can take in, okay, is set based on a no effect level in animals. So in other words, laboratory animals are given high, high doses of pesticide. And the highest dose that you can get to, all right, that causes no observable effect is the cutoff, all right? So the, the laboratory animal is not getting sick. And they do a comprehensive battery of short and long-term testing on these animals to establish what that no adverse effect level is. Then what they do is they build in a hundred to a thousand fold safety factor and apply that. So it, so a thousand times less than the no effect level in animals. And what this does is it assures that human exposure by a diet is limited to levels a hundred or more times below a level that causes no toxicity. So this graphic kind of helps a little bit. So what they'll do when they're setting residue limits is they'll take an individual crop, and in this case it's soybeans, and what they will do is they will try to figure out the maximum amount of, and maximum rate of application of a pesticide on that kind of crop, and they'll provide a range of residue levels. And then what they'll do is they'll set the tolerance at the top of the range and on just under the maximum approved uh, uses. 
Then moving on further, they'll look at, so that's the tolerance. Moving on further, they'll try to uh, look at all of the different exposures that people can have. So they've got the crop, and then they'll go and build in an exposure assessment. So they'll look at all treated food, they'll look at air and water, and they will set a limit on the maximum, maximum exposure that, uh, including kids, that people can have. That maximum Maximum exposure is way below the allowable daily intake, all right? And so remember, the allowable daily intake is the non-toxic animal dose with a 100 to 1,000 fold safety factor built in. So it's virtually impossible to get sick from something that doesn't make, that make you toxic, all right? So once again, in, in another visual, um, you'll take a crop form, for example, the maximum application on the, of the pesticide on that uh, corn will get sort of be lo a lot less on the kernels, which are protected from the stalks, or protected by the, by the uh, shucks. And then the food processing makes it even less. And then when you ingest it, your digestive enzymes and everything make that, e that exposure even less. And the sum of all this is up to 10,000 times less than the maximum dose that causes no effect in animals. Once again, this is heavily regulated by the EPA. So how about a practical example? So let's take a 55 kilogram adult. How many soybeans does this person need to eat to exceed the ADI? Well, tolerances are measured in parts per million or milligrams per kilogram. The soybean tolerance is 20 parts per, mill mill uh, parts per million. You would have to eat 11 pounds of soybean every day to reach the ADI, and that's virtually impossible for glyphosate. Another visual that might be helpful, you would have to eat a Fruit Loop this big every day for 70 years to even get to the ADI for glyphosate. So it's virtually impossible to get sick from that. So let's pause for any questions. I hope that sort of clarifies uh, how we go about setting tolerances and the allowable daily intake for uh, pesticides. Wow, Liza, thank you so much. Uh, and I love the graphics that you were using. We're going to give the uh, participants a few seconds to uh, formulate any questions they might have about what you just shared with us. And uh, please feel free to write those questions in the chat window. And then we'll come back and uh, and try to answer them. Also, feel free to put down uh, in the chat window anything that you've found uh, interesting so far that uh, you know you're going to want to share with others. Uh, I. I know I was uh, putting in a couple of things uh, during the chat when uh, Liza was talking because there's so many things that she's mentioning that I want to make sure I don't forget. So I was actually using a chat window as my little notepad. <laughs> it looks like we may not have any questions at this point in time, Liza. So we'll keep uh, mo monitoring that chat window to check for those as we go along. And uh, just want to remind everybody that there will be a collection uh, URL that will be shared with you at a, a point in time, and in that uh, will be the slides of this presentation. So I think we're going to go ahead and pass the microphone on to, is it Michael that comes next? Welcome, Michael. Be sure to turn your mic on. Yeah, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I just had to switch uh, headphones with uh, Liza. Can you guys hear me okay? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll, let's uh, go ahead and, and, and move away from uh, sort of the, 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 uh, the uh, regulation angle, and, and we're going to talk about a bit about the future and, and how can we make uh, a better pesticide, uh, you know, how can we lower the use rate uh, in, in the environment to continue to try to in increase uh, the benefits for farmers. And so uh, I just want to kind of circle back to something uh, that, that Doug alluded to uh, earlier 
Um, and this is, gives a little bit more of a, uh, some numbers uh, behind it. And this is a study that was, that's been done about 10 years or so ago, but it continues uh, to hold up. And this is sort of the, the average uh, global loss in yield for, for three of the major uh, uh, row crops. Uh, and, uh, and you can see that weeds is a, is a significant factor. It's a, it's a significant factor here in, in all three of these, but you also have uh, things like insects and then diseases. And diseases can be broken up into um, uh, into uh, a multiple different times. Um, Hello, uh, and welcome to the meeting. Please enter your passcode, followed by the pound or hash key, and I'll connect you. Eliza, you may want to. Okay. Please hold while I confirm your passcode. Thank you for joining Global Meet. Okay. I guess when I'll just you talk through phone, now. You will be the second person to join the meeting. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, the uh, um, and, and diseases can be broken up into um, things like viruses or, or fungal diseases, and you can also even have some some other single cell organisms like protozoans that be part of this. So all three of the, these are critical. Um, all three of these uh, have um, uh, uh, really important impacts on the years. And this is the global amount. Uh, and, and so uh, you can have things that are even more devastating uh, from some diseases. You can have 100% destruction of uh, crop in, in some cases, and this continues to happen uh, in many areas of the world if a, if a particular blight uh, can come through. <clears throat> uh, so how are they applied? And this gets a little bit about uh, what Eliza was discussing about exposure. So you can have a, a whole treatment, a whole area spray from, from an overhead uh, um, perspective, of, for example, an overhead uh, spray or boom, um, or other approaches where the entire field is spray. Um, you can also have uh, other issues where, whereby the, uh, the the pesticide is put into a granule, it's a small amount of a solid that, that's put ne right next to the plant, and then is dissolved by water, some other mechanism to allow for for movement near the plant to to, uh, to inhibit pests near there. And then in the more recent uh, approach, and this is something that Monsanto um, is, is pretty heavily involved in, is just treating the seed. Uh, that gets planted into the ground, putting in fungicides or insecticides uh, into the seeds so that you have a much more localized uh, presence uh, of, the, uh, of the pest control product. And these are more targeted from, from left, uh, left to right, as you might imagine. So we're now on the cusp of really moving into the next phase of this, which is to produce, using advanced diagnostic and analytic approaches and artificial intelligence approaches uh, to get to the point where you can have a machine that goes over a field and can spot when you have a, a good crop. And these are all the green squares here. And this is from a company called Blue River uh, Technology, which is uh, one, of the, one of the people at the forefront of this, one of the companies at the forefront of this, um, whereby uh, you can just spot the crop uh, and also spot what is not wanted, which are weeds uh, in this particular case. And it will simply spray in those specific areas um, or, or remove those, those specific uh, um, pests um, or weeds uh, and, and leave the crop alone. You can imagine that moving into the future now, you can survey along crops and see which ones seem to have the beginning of a, a disease developing and you just spray that particular plant uh, with fungicide. So continuing to try to decrease uh, exposure with advanced technologies is a, uh, um, uh, you know, one, one, of the, one of the areas that we're actively involved with. So this is a concept that I'm going to talk about over the next uh, few slides, which is this, this concept of mode of action, uh, which is also called MOA. Uh, and I will discuss this later with regards to resistance on mechanisms. And what you, what you don't want to try to do is have a, uh, try to control a pest with only one single method, whether or not that's a chemical method or biological method or with tilling or, or other methods or other cultural methods. You are going to get uh, res select for resistant to individuals. You need to have a combination approach, uh, you know, a multiple, a multiple methods at the same time uh, in order to prevent selection of individuals. And so I show one example here where resistance to a cultural method uh, it takes place. And so uh, this particular uh, species of bug called the, the northern corn rootworm um, will, will stay in the soil um, and will come out, used to come out every year when, when farmers were propping corn on corn over and over again every year. And so they started to rotate cross between corn and soy or corn, soy, and alfalfa. Uh, for example, uh, in between years, uh, so that when this bug came out, it wouldn't be able to, uh, to, to eat the corn. Uh, but what it, what it, it has evolved now from this cultural practice, whereby uh, it'll simply hibernate for a longer period of time. It'll stay in the ground for an extra year and wait for that corn uh, to come back out again. So there is um, 
uh, you know, natural uh, methods uh, here or cultural methods that can be overcome by selection for resistance. Uh, the other major area, you know, that we'll, that we discuss, we'll be discussing here is agrochemical resistance. And this is a, a similar to what, how we think about antibiotic resistance uh, with bacteria. I'm shown here on the right here is just a, a, a growth of, of, of glyphosate resistant palmer and in the presence of soybean field, you see all these little stalks uh, coming up. And an important point here is that you hear the term in, in the media quite a bit of something called superbugs or, or superweeds, um, but really it, it's, they're no more super than before the, the chemistry or the control method that was introduced before that. You basically just have to go back in time to before that it was used and try a different method or a combination of, of methods uh, for that purpose. And so, um, yeah, so it's a bit, there are, there potentially are other ways we have to continue to try to, to try to think about that more clever ways, including you know, all these, all these different methods in order to get uh, to the point where we're able to control and, and increase yields. Okay. I want to talk about just one specific thing, and this is something that Monsanto is, is, is the most heavily involved with, although we work in other areas as well, which is, which are herbicides. And all these little uh, hexagon uh, squares in the background are different chemistries. Uh, that are that are used um, for uh, uh, for control of wheat, and they they're kind of clustered into multiple uh, different areas. And you can see that the protein target here in each of these cases, um, and these are these are these are the proteins that are essential for, for growing uh, within the plant and systems that are essential for for, for the plant uh, to grow. And you see a lot of times these are specific for plants. You don't have photosynthesis, for example, in, in, in mammalians or, or insects or other non-target organisms. So this is a, a fairly specific thing for inhibiting plant growth. There's other cases where plants make uh, just make, make amino acids that the mammals uh, do not make. And I'll, I'll talk in more detail about that uh, in, in the future slide. So you can see that there's maybe um, eight to ten different types of, of modes of action that we that we have right now for herbicides. And th this is a, a, another way uh, of looking at this, and, and part of the issue is that, uh, uh, and so these are all the, all the different modes of action. I think I misspoke earlier. It looks like there's you know, a, a couple of dozen different modes of action uh, for herbicide control. But what you can see here is that there's not been a new mode of action introduced, a new type of chemistry, a new protein target introduced uh, for about 17 years. And so there is a need, and this is part of what well, my job is and what Doug's job is, uh, is to try to find different modes of actions that are, that are safe and effective uh, for, for controlling weeds um, here. So, uh, and, and this is becoming a, a more and more uh, of an issue. So this is a, another uh, slide here where we've got a number of uh, cases of resistance uh, to herbicides um, here on this particular axis in the year that, that it was uh, uh, that it was first uh, discovered. And you can see both in Europe uh, as well as in the United States, um, whether it's before or after the introduction of uh, herbicide to crops and to GM crops, there continues to be a steady increase in the number of, of, of uh, resistant weeds that are out there. So the need to try to try to find more than one way uh, to control these weeds uh, continues to be uh, quite important. Uh, so let's dig down specifically into, into one particular mode of action, and this is a, you know, the molecule that we've discussed in the past, which, which is uh, glyphosate. And this is an enzyme that's in, involved with uh, aromatic amino, bio, amino acid biosynthesis uh, within plants, um, and, and it's only found uh, within plants. Uh, mammals need need the final product of this uh, as well, but they they take it up externally uh, from from eating plants or or other organisms or from supplementation. So, uh, plants require this enzyme uh, in order in order to in order to grow while it's not present uh, within mammals. And glyphosate uh, blocks this particular step, which is a, a, a EPSP synthase, and it makes this final product, which I'll I will not to, uh, attempt to pronounce uh, in, in lieu of time here. So, uh, and, and so glyphosate inhibits this enzyme, and we know a lot about this particular uh, molecule and, and the protein target that it interacts with. And here's just a, sort of a stylized example of a protein structure, uh, which are all these multicolored ribbons here. And here's the glyphosate molecule right, right in the middle of this. It's really a fascinating uh, structure where it, it almost opens up like, like a clam. Uh, and then when glyphosate and this other substrate, uh, other substrates come into it, it closes basically within it. And we know all this, all the interactions here. And then the knowledge of having this specific enzyme as well as inhibitor can, you know, can help to improve, uh, can, can we make this better? Can we make another protein target better by trying to, uh, to, to find molecules that bind, that, that bind more tightly um, or that, that only bind to the plant enzyme and not to non-target organism enzymes? And this is uh, my last slide. And this is where I, you know, myself and Doug and others are really heavily involved with. So there's, there's, there's multiple methods to try to find new molecules, whether or not it's for herbicide, 
uh, uh, or, or for insecticides or, or other, other methods of fungicides as well. Um, and initially, uh, a lot of work was done on what's called library base. So a lot of these companies, pharma companies as well as agrochemical companies, had large libraries of compounds, tens of millions of compounds that they tried to test somewhat blindly uh, to see whether or not they would have this effect. And they didn't always know the mode of action in these particular cases. They may figure it out later, um, but a lot of times it was, it was just sort of this brute force sort of type of approach. And the more modern uh, methods, uh, what you're seeing a lot more of is, is using um, you know, computational approaches to say, well, look at this molecule. Look, look, this is an active molecule. What are the features about it that are attractive uh, for controlling weeds, but, but also allow it to be safe for, for non-targeting organisms? So there's a lot of approaches to try to make uh, close uh, you know, or somewhat distant uh, you know, variants of these particular molecules to try to improve upon their efficacy. And what I discussed briefly here at the end as well is that we have a lot of structures of proteins now uh, that, are, that are some of our favorite targets of plants, essential proteins within plants that perhaps are not found in mammals. And can we, can we move these molecules into here, um, you know, in, in, a, in a virtual way initially to try to help uh, screen before we, you know, without having to spend all this money and time on screening these, these large libraries. And we're, we're involved in quite a few of collaborations now that use very advanced computational techniques, uh, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence to help help screen basically in uh, you know in the computer to try to figure out and nominate these molecules better, uh, and then we just test a fairly small amount uh, to move forward. So I believe that's my last slide. So I'll pause there. Michael, thank you so much. Um, we're going to go ahead and continue on, and I'll keep monitoring the chat window for any questions. Uh, we'll go ahead and let uh, Doug Sammons begin his presentation. Doug? Yes, can you hear me now? Um, you sound great. Okay, great. Um, resistance. Now, resistance is, um, you know, the bane of a lot of us for antibiotics and, and of course, in the herbicide uh, and pesticide industry resistance which is a big deal. So, so we're getting uh, sound from somebody who hasn't turned off their mic. Maybe mic. Okay. So selection, survival of the fittest. You know, this is uh, the famous Darwin conclusion, and here's a quote from his Natural Selection, a book on the origin of species. He's, I've called this principle by which each slight variation, if useful, is preserved by the term natural selection. Um, and of course, he wrote that in about a little more than 100 years ago in his studies. And in this example here uh, that Wayne uh, Parrott put together from the University of Georgia, is showing the evolution of a wild cabbage uh, into kale and then uh, into cabbage itself about 100 AD and then into cauliflower and into Brussels sprouts around 1700. And then cauliflower later, I think some people think it hybridized, but uh, others believe it, it mutated into broccoli. And so uh, this, this just illustrates the kind of variation that's possible with the primary genetic material that can be in a, in a um, land race or uh, species. And so, um, you know, today in agriculture, we can take advantage of this and we can increase this time. So natural variation basically requires changing the code or a genetic variation. So natural variation takes a long, long time. And this happens basically by sunlight, which is a form of radiation, uh, or inborn errors just in the enzymes that are uh, carrying out the normal cell division process. And so, um, this takes a long time. So what we can think about doing is how to induce mutagenesis to change the code intentionally uh, in sort of a random way. Now we do this by adding genes with genetically modified organisms, but in this case, this is sort of random. And so you can do that with chemicals, and this is one of the things we all worry about, and uh, who's going to get cancer based on exposure to some chemistry. But I want to tell you that um, that all pesticides are tested for the ability to cause cancer, and um, anything that's even close to causing uh, cancer is just not permitted. So, so this, this is not some place where we're wishy-washy about the regulations on the use of pesticides. So pesticides themselves 
uh, that we use do not cause cancer in animals, and they do not cause mutations in plants. And our, so our primary concern here is that, that these compounds would affect the plants, so they might also affect us. So this is just not allowed in the pesticide industry. Now, another way to get mutations to change the code is to use nuclear bombardment or radio, a radioactive source and you expose the seed, and this can cause genetic mutations that would result in speeding up evolution. Of course, a lot of the mutations you get are not what you want, so you have to sift through thousands and hundreds of thousands of seeds to find the one you may want. And then, of course, you may not get just what you want, and so this is really difficult to control. But the conclusion is that changing the seed is one thing, and it's not going to affect us in our diet um, uh, unless other changes have occurred that might be detrimental. And there's the case of this in tomatoes where the, um, the toxin tomatine in tomatoes was increased um, from a, this kind of a change and that was created, and the, those could not be used. So this can happen. Okay. So what we need then to get resistance is to change the code. So once you start to get variations, uh, there are different resistance mechanisms. And so if you have a large population, like I'm sure in this petri plate, um, a low dose of the compound of interest will control some but not all. And so this then reflects the variation that's in that population. Uh, an example of this for herbicide is acetolactate synthase, where it's pretty easy to get resistance mutations. But those mutations, unfortunately, can create very high levels of resistance. So even using a high dose, which might kill some of them, it won't kill them all. And in fact, in this system, a plant mutation uh, for the herbicide binding site can create plants that are immune to the herbicide. And so this is uh, a function of this particular target enzyme. Another case here I want to talk about is for glyphosate. Glyphosate itself is a, what's called chemically a transition state inhibitor. It's very difficult to get mutations in the target site. And so there are very few mutations. And if you use a low dose, you can find them. But if you use a high dose, you can control most of them. And so resistance has been very slow to develop for glyphosate. Although these days there are more weeds, and I've been studying the mechanism of action. So the point is that different targets have different propensity to get these mutations. And the dose of that selection matters. And let me show you how that would work. So in this slide, what I'm trying to show is that the fold resistance is a function of the different resistance mechanisms. So target side or changing the code mutations can give even immunity, but you get a wide range of resistance magnitudes. Metabolism, in this case, is not like digestion. This is the chemical modification of the compound, so now it no longer can do its function. And um, this is the most common form of resistance, and this is what we depend on for natural crop safety. So some herbicides are safe, we say, in corn or soybeans, and so we can use them to kill the weeds, and not the corn. And, they, uh, and we use these two mechanisms to create our genetically modified crops. So Roundup Ready uses a target site type resistance mechanism to, to create something near immunity. Uh, Liberty Link herbicide, on the other hand, uh, for Liberty herbicide, uses a metabolism mechanism to uh, change the structure of the glufosinate that's used in the Liberty herbicide. So we've learned from nature how to do this, and that's helped us create our new era of genetically modified uh, herbicide-tolerant plants. Now, third, a third mechanism is just sort of the last remaining one, and it's exclusion. That is keeping the herbicide or pesticide away from its target. And this is common for glyphosate, actually, and these mechanisms are pretty weak. The red dots I've put in here are uh, particular targets that I've studied uh, that have appeared, and they have some more resistance than we thought. This picture is the first one that we found to have an exclusion mechanism where the glyphosate is packed away in the vacuole of the plant cell so that this plant is not controlled by the glyphosate, but this uh, a plant adjacent to it is. And this is always a, a sign of a resistance population when some plants are dead 
and others are left unaffected. Okay, now, um, so how does resistance, you know, really get selected? So in this cartoon, what I'm showing is um, some arbitrary uh, amount of herbicide. So I've got here a labeled rate, and that's this amount. So when we go out to spray our herbicide, we expect that we're going to put on this amount, and I've just labeled that one. So that's the intended label rate. What I'm showing here are just a population of individuals that are different sizes and they have different genetics. And so I picked this one red because let's say it has a, a mutation, but the labeled rate isn't, suffic isn't sufficient, so it increases, this plant can stand a higher dose. But the reality is that in the field, the plants all get a range of doses. And so if this plant happens to get enough herbicide, it will still die. So having a mutation didn't really help it. On the other hand, this plant had a different mutation that created a higher level of resistance. And in this case, no dose that we applied would have, would have affected this individual. This guy is going to survive, okay, and make progeny. Now over here, we have plants that are surviving uh, because they didn't get enough herbicide. But this one had a mutation, so it could have stood a little higher dose. But since it didn't really need the mutation to survive, it's not really selected. It's just sort of still hiding in the population. So this kind of thinking is important as we consider our management criteria. And, and one of the reasons why we want to always use a high dose, so the weaker resistance mechanisms uh, are not selected for and accumulated in the population. Now, uh, and this is a case from my own research that I've shown in a number of slides at the Weed Science Society. This is Palmer uh, amaranthus or Palmer pigweed, uh, and it was found resistant to glyphosate in cotton fields. And these plants had become resistant to glyphosate in part by creating extra copies of the genomic copies, so gene duplication. Uh, which had been known in cancers and other kinds of rare diseases. But in this case, the plants were doing it. And these two lines, R25 and R20, both had 35 copies. So when we um, treated these plants with glyphosate at different rates based on the field rate, this upper one was completely killed at the higher rates, whereas this one down below is not. So it's clear that there's yet another mechanism being used by this line that makes it resistant. And this is the point, that these resistant mechanisms can be additive, and you can accumulate more than one mechanism to defeat the herbicide or pesticide. So what are the factors for the evolution of resistance? Well, it's using too much and using only glyphosate. So here, fallow means that you know we're waiting to plant the crop and we're going to control these weeds with glyphosate. And if you just do this over and over again with glyphosate at low rates, uh, like was done in Australia in particular, um, then you can get resistance, a selection of resistant weeds. Uh, a lot of resistance appears in orchards and vineyards, in part because of the irrigation to keep the survivors alive, um, but also because people use this herbicide over and over again, because when the plants are dormant, they're not affected by the glyphosate, and it's convenient to use. Um, and glyphosate-resistant crops, the farmers have taken advantage of the system and used, tried to use only glyphosate. And on large acres with enough plants are treated, then the individuals that were found that were selected for resistance, and that has started to become a problem. So what do we uh, expect to do then? For managing weeds, and to slow down the development of resistance, we suggest starting early in your growing season to control the weeds and to keep the weeds out. And you do this, and for, for insects, you survey, uh, and for diseases, you scout your field so you can time your application of your pesticide. The other thing is to use multiple modes of action in mixtures. Rotation has been, uh, dis been discovered to not be as effective as mixtures. Uh, and so this is the, the, the uh, up-to-date uh, recommendation. And so the idea is to use conventional and the newest combinations that are available. And also to hit the, the plants, in this case, 
at different life stages. So as the seedling stage and also at the post-emergent stage. Um, and of course, we want to use the labeled rate. And a lot of farmers on large acres want to use less herbicide. And as I showed you, they can select for low resistance mechanisms that can accumulate. And so this also requires the right timing to apply the herbicide and by the right way, methods, methods. And of course, it's also important to use the other mechanisms that we can use to crowd weeds out. They're competitive and so cover crops work. And it's found, we've also found for Palmer amaranth in the south that a tillage, a deep tillage, um, moving away from conservation tillage, we can help bury that weed seed and then um, and that'll help for a couple more years in our no-till crop. And I think that's the most of what I wanted to cover. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm uh, willing to take them now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug. This is such an interesting webinar. I can't wait to get the archive so I can go over this again because it's just a whole lot to digest. We're going to go ahead now and uh, continue on. Uh, Doug, could you turn off your microphone, pretty please? And uh, we're going to do our thank yous to uh, uh, to you guys. And uh, those of you who uh, stick around, we'll have a chance for you to ask questions after our brief uh, webinar tonight. So I'd like to thank today's presenters, Valerie Bays, Michael Crawford, Doug Sammons, Liza Halcom, and Cole Wagner. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and experiences tonight with us. I'd also like to thank uh, Monsanto for sponsoring today's program. And thank you to the administration of NSTA for their support of web seminars. This concludes our program for this evening. Thank you for coming, everybody. <laughs>